see. All right. So, um, continuing on with hormones. So, when we talk about the kidney with each of these hormones, in general, when we talk about hormones, there must be a receptor for the hormone. And we must produce the hormone, okay? If we overproduce the hormone, we're going to overstimulate whatever the hormone stimulates, okay? So with controlling pressure in the body, that's really what we're looking at here. We're controlling blood pressure. All of these for the most, well, minus parathyroid, are working on that. <laughs> so ADH, antidiuretic hormone, that's going to control water. It's going to help us keep water, so keep blood pressure. Aldosterone is going to work on keeping salt. So if we keep salt, we increase blood pressure. ANP, atrial uh, nitriatic peptide, that's too much pressure. So we're going to get rid of pressure. Um, so we're going to lower it. So that's how those are working on blood pressure. So keep that in mind as we go through them. You need to know each one. Uh, and know what it affects. So if it increases, it decreases, what the effect would happen to the body, okay? So ADH, antidiuretic hormone, is made by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is sitting here and monitoring your blood as it passes by it. And if it sees that there is too much osmolarity, they're saying salt, but it really is osmolarity, Okay, there's too much solute in there. You're a salty person, You're mad about everything, <laughs> right? Um, if it sees too much of that, then what it's going to say is, I need to hold on to water so I can dilute this. So it's going to release ADH. ADH is going to tell the kidneys, insert aquaporins and pull the water out of the nephron back into the bloodstream. And we're going to hold on to that water. We're going to conserve it. So water reabsorption, we talked about this last week, it happens in ascending limb, DCT, and collecting duct. The only way it can happen, though, is if we insert aquaporins. So ADH is released. We see there's high osmolarity in the blood. We release ADH. We pull the water out of the nephron, and we pull it back into our bloodstream and dilute our bloodstream. What happens to the concentration of the urine? If I pull water out of that nephron, is my urine have higher osmolarity or lower osmolarity? Is concentration more or is it more diluted? That's your first question of the day. If you release ADH, you dilute your blood. What happens to your urine? Is your urine more diluted or more concentrated? concentrated. Correct. You're pulling moisture out of it. You're pulling water out of it. So there's more osmolarity in your urine and less in your blood. So ADH inserts the aquaporins. That allows us to absorb water back into our bloodstream from the ascending loop of Henle, the collecting duct, and the DCT. And the reason being, they are cuboidal cells. So you can't, the water just can't make it through them. So by putting the aquaporins, we now give them a channel for the water to pull back into the bloodstream. So if there's no ADH, let's say I drank too much water. My hypothalamus is not going to release ADH. We don't need to keep diluting. If we keep diluting, we're going to create a hypotonic solution in our bloodstream. We're going to be in big, big trouble. So what do we do? We don't make ADH. If we don't make ADH, we don't put in aquaporins. So what happens in the nephron? We leave the water. So where's the water go? Out in the urine. Well, if there's more water in my urine, I'm diluting my urine. And I'm slowly increasing the osmolarity of my bloodstream by decreasing the water volume inside of it. Diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with sugar. Diabetes, it just really is referencing uh, excess urine. That's really what it comes down to. So in diabetes insipidus, there is a population that are either, they cannot produce ADH 
there's something wrong with the uh, pituitary and they can't release it or they don't have the receptors in the kidney for it. That's diabetes insipidus. So for them, <clears throat> they're always losing free water. When they drink water, it goes out of their body. And eventually what happens is they actually lose osmolarity because as water leaves, like other things are leaving with it. And so they can also overhydrate. Uh, they'll keep on drinking and they'll water down their electrolytes in their body. Uh, so they do have to monitor how much like water they drink. And then um, if they're just not producing ADH, we can actually give them a drug uh, to help mimic ADH uh, and they can have normal normalcy. Okay. Alcohol and caffeine inhibit ADH. That's why you break the seal. Okay, it doesn't matter how much you try and not to urinate after having some drinks, you're going to pee and you're going to lose free water. And that's a big part of why people get like hangovers, they dehydrate. Um, what's wild is how long it works for, especially when you talk about caffeine. So caffeine has a four hour half life, meaning when you drink a Red Bull, how much, ca how much caffeine is in a Red Bull? Anyone know? Anyone got one sitting in front of them? It's probably like 160 milligrams, something absurd. Let's see. How much caffeine in a Red Bull? Oh, it's a suggested search. 111 milligrams in your little tiny guy. Okay, 111 milligrams. So I'm gonna break out a calculator because my brain doesn't want to work today. So 111, you drink it at... I don't know, you want to study in the afternoon. So let's say at 4 p.m., you say, I'm going to have a Red Bull so I can sit down and study. Four and a half hours later, we'll just say four hours later, half of it is in your body still. So you take that 111, you divide it by two, 55 and a half milligrams are still in your body at 8 p.m. That's the equivalent. 55 milligrams is about the equivalent of a cup of coffee. Let's say you're going to go to bed. It's now and midnight. At midnight, you're, you're trying to sleep at 10, right? Be a responsible student, get a good sleep cycle. At midnight, you still have another half of that. So you still have 27.75 milligrams of caffeine in your body. That's probably about the equivalent of a cup of tea at midnight. Divide that by two. Four o'clock in the morning, you got 13.8. 75 milligrams of caffeine in your bloodstream. You shouldn't drink caffeine later in the day. It's going to continually dehydrate you and it's going to affect your sleep. And so you get into this dirty cycle of, um, of needing it in the morning because you're so tired and then needing it more in the afternoon. And then what it's doing is keeping you up at, at night. Uh, caffeine, there's actually like studies on it. There is zero effect on increasing like memory capacity or concentration capacity. It, it's a false sense of I can focus and study more if I have some caffeine. It, it's actually, it has no benefit whatsoever. Um, you're better off going to sleep, getting rest, waking up, being fresh and studying. And it's also dehydrating you continually. That being said, I love my morning cup of coffee. Big old guy. There's no getting away with it. I mean, caffeine legitimate. If you're, if you're a coffee drinker, you know you're addicted to coffee. I've had to stop cold turkey oh, <laughs> twice. I, I stopped cold turkey twice, and it was rough. One, I was, like, studying for boards. Uh, I was, like, in my, like, prep course, and they're like, just quit it now while you can because our exams are seven and eight hours or eight and nine hours long. <clears throat> so, like, getting up for a bathroom break isn't – easily doable. You can't take breaks uh, in the middle of a block. You've got to finish like a block of questions and you can take a break and you don't want to crash. So that's the other reason. So I remember I stopped in the middle of like my course. I was like, okay, I just got to commit to it and hard stop. And man, this girl next to me that you sit next to me, she would go to Starbucks after lunch, like our lunch break and sit next to me. And I would have the worst headache, like the first couple days or so worst headache ever. She sit next to me and just the smell of it my headache would disappear. That's, that's, that is like what addiction is truly that our bodies do get addicted to caffeine. Uh, it's a stimulant. And then after that, it was fine. And then when I had my heart issue, I had to cold Turkey it again. 
that was rough. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about someone that was drinking like a pot a day easily, but we've cut it back. All right. Same thing with alcohol. It, it dehydrates the crap out of you. If you want to feel better as far as hydration purposes, scale them back. All right. Tell you, one of the other best things they told us, like when you're you're going to take your tests, uh, you, you need to eat well, right? In the morning, like you eat a good meal and that helps sustain your energy and then peanut M&Ms. That was like the secret trick. Whenever you take a break, take some peanut M&Ms and then have your lunch and just keep on between it, have peanut M&Ms. The reason being the brain needs glucose. So there's a, in the chocolate, the candy, and then the the peanut inside of it is protein. So it gives you a more sustained uh, energy level. It works. <laughs> Peanut M&Ms are the secret, right? All right. So uh, we talked about this, the concentrated urine. I mentioned this on the board last week. So as we're going through the nephron, we're going down the descending uh, loop of Henle. And then we're going to start curving up to the ascending loop of Henle. Simultaneously, there is what is called the vasa recta. There's blood vessels going the opposite way. So what happens in loop of Henle, we pull out all the solute on the ascending side. We dump it into that blood. So as this blood is going down towards the bottom now of loop of Henle, there's lots of solute in it. And the, the loop of Henle at its bottom also has a lot of salt in it because we haven't pulled it out yet. We're going to pull it out on the ascending loop. So when the two cross paths, it's very, very salty. This is at the base of the pyramid. Right, so that's where we get that salty medulla statement from. It helps with concentrating urine because now, when that solute that's in vasa recta comes up by ascending loop of Henle, any simple squamous water will just leach out. It's going to follow the solute, right? Osmotic pressure. Anytime there's high solute, water's going to follow it. And that's osmosis. So. Counter current flow, that's what they're talking about. The two directions that we're going, vasa recta is going one way and our nephron is going the opposite. In the ascending limb, water cannot leach out because it's cuboidal cells. So what do we pull out? Sodium, potassium, chloride. We're using transmembrane proteins to pull it out. And as it enters that vessel, the vasa recta, and is traveling down, it makes it salty. Okay. So that's what they're showing here. On the, on the ascending loop, we're pulling out all our electrolytes, and now it's in the vasa recta. So down here, this is really salty. The vessel itself is really, really salty. Simultaneously, because we haven't pulled the solute out of the nephron at the base of loop of Henle, it's also very, very salty. So at the base of the pyramid, this is a very salty region. And then the, as we're coming up here, because the descending loop is simple squamous, water leaches out. So we start to redilute this. So we need ADH to also help with this. So we insert it into the uh, aquaporins when ADH is released, remember into Ascending loop of Henle, DCT, collecting duct. And that allows us to pull water back into our bloodstream. So ADH, they say DCT and collecting duct, but it really also should be, <clears throat> really also should be um, ascending loop of Henle. All right, electrolyte balance. So aldosterone, the adrenal gland makes it. So adrenals are sitting on the kidneys. That's where they're located. And it's going to produce aldosterone whenever sodium levels are altered or potassium. So if we release aldosterone, sodium and potassium are antiporters. So if sodium, I'm sorry, if aldosterone is released, I pull sodium back into my bloodstream, I pee out potassium. So if my blood pressure is low or my sodium level is low, I produce aldosterone. I pull the sodium back in, water follows, blood pressure goes up. 
potassium levels decrease. If my potassium is very high, which is pretty hard to do, okay? Like the amount in a banana is like negligible. Spinach has more, right? It's negligible. Um, my potassium will be high. Let's say I ate a bunch of spinach. I'm good old Popeye. What's going to happen? I'm going to stop producing aldosterone. Sorry. No, I'm going to produce al aldosterone. Yeah. I'm going to produce aldosterone so I can pee it out to lower it. Simultaneously, I'm going to increase my sodium level. My blood pressure is going to go up. So one of the first things we say, like when someone has high blood pressure, what do they cut from their diet? Salt, right? If you lower salt levels in your bloodstream, there's less solute to hold on to water. Blood pressure decreases. Okay. AMP. So right atrium of the heart. If there's too much blood in there and it starts exerting force on the right atria, we release AMP. AMP, AMP makes us secrete sodium. Solute leaves a nephron. Who follows? Water. Osmotic pressure. Okay? So that's why, like, drinking salt water is incredibly dangerous. Like, if you're, you know, you're stranded in the middle of the ocean, it is more dangerous to drink salt water than to not drink water at all. Because you have that excess sodium in your body. Your body's going to go, we don't need this excess sodium. Let's get rid of it. Water's going to follow. You dehydrate yourself faster. And then parathyroid. So this is going to affect calcium and phosphorus levels. We don't cover the phosphorus side of it, I believe. But if you have too much calcium, the parathyroid gland, the little tiny guys on the back of the thyroid, when you look at the model, the little rice looking guys, will it'll be secreted and calcium will be pulled into the bloodstream. So if your calcium level is low and you release PTH, you're going to pull it from your gut. You're going to increase absorption into your gut. You're going to increase absorption from the nephron and you're going to pull it out of your bone. So if calcium levels are high, we won't produce PTH. We'll deposit more in our bone and we'll pee out calcium. So when people like have PTH level issues, like it's low, um, really low, then they'll urinate out calcium. They tend to get kidney stones. You take too much calcium, you risk getting kidney stones. Specifically, people that eat leafy greens with calcium. Calcium in kids is good. Calcium in adults, pretty pointless. Like when you talk about like osteoporosis, the biggest factor is genetics. What's the best thing you can do to prevent osteoporosis? Side question. Since we're talking about calcium, what's the best thing to prevent osteoporosis? You guys should know this. We should have talked about it in AP1. Anyone? Come on, someone, someone's got to take a guess. What's the best thing you can do to prevent osteoporosis? Nothing? No one? Did y'all run away at home? What kind of exercise? It, exercise is correct, but it's a very specific type of exercise. Lifting weights. You strain, you strain your bone. You put that excess weight on it. You'll deposit more calcium in it to strengthen it. You'll turn over the matrix. Okay? Lift weights. They used to say like, oh, the water aerobics, drinking calcium... Nothing's overriding genetics. If you have osteoporosis in your family, you can't beat genetics. The only thing we can truly do is lift weights. Now, when you're growing, you need the calcium to repair or if you have injury. So like when I had like my knee surgery and the cut bone and all this, yeah, I took, I took a multivitamin with calcium in it to help a repair. Uh, but otherwise, as an adult, taking calcium really doesn't do much for you. All right. So... Um, we talked about ADH, we talked about aldosterone, AMP, and parathyroid. Make sure you guys go through like when it's released, what happens in the bloodstream, 
and what happens in the urine. What levels increase, what level decrease, depending on if you release or uh, don't release the hormone. Make sure you understand that. EPO, erythropoietin. So EPO, the kidney are very susceptible to injury from lack of oxygen. So if the kidney sees there's low oxygen levels, it releases EPO. EPO acts on the bone marrow, red bone marrow, to increase red blood cell production. All right. So like people with like kidney failure, we've got to give them erythropoietin. We give them EPO injections to increase their production or to have them make red blood cells, period. Okay. Without it, they'll become anemic. Did we talk about Lance Armstrong? I don't remember if I talked about this. He got caught, the, the cyclist dude, he got caught injecting EPO. That was the first time he got caught. And then the second time he was pulling his own blood and then pumping it back into himself uh, right before an event. And, and so that's like blood doping. Um, <clears throat> so yeah. Interestingly enough, you can't give EPO to Mormons. I forget who's, who's the group of, uh, what religion they can't accept blood products. Is it Mormons? I always forget. Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. Jehovah's Witness. You can't give them EPO. Um, it has, it has like a blood product in it. And so they'll decline it. Really interesting fact, you can give it to a minor. If a, if a Jehovah's Witness minor comes in, you can give it to him. So like, that's one of the, like, you know, in school we have to go over like ethics and like how you, how you deal with this stuff. And the scenario always is a family comes in, they were in a car accident. The husband is alert. The mother or the wife is unconscious and the child is unconscious. Both need blood to survive. The husband says, you know, we're Jehovah's Witness. We cannot accept blood. Do not give them blood. You can give it to the child. Because they are a minor, they cannot withhold life-saving measures. Whereas an adult, like the wife, you legally cannot give it to them without repercussions. It's pretty wild. It's fun. Fun. The other fun one that I always got a kick out of was, what do you do when... Parents come in with a child and the child has obvious signs of abuse for the parents. Everyone's always like, you call CPS, do all this. No, no. You pick up the child and walk out of the room. Because in the time you go to call CPS, they could kind of catch on to it and injure the child or leave with the child. So you remove them from danger immediately. Put yourself in danger instead. <laughs> right? That's where you just walk outside the door and you're like, call security. <laughs> Anywho, all right, calci trial. So calci trial, when the kidney releases this, is because it needs calcium. Uh, it's to increase calcium absorption. So it works on the GI tract. So we can absorb it from our diet. And then renin. Renin, we're going to run through this. This is going to control blood pressure. So when the kidney sees high osmolarity, low pressure, it starts to release renin. Right, and we're gonna see it's like a cascade um, of hormones. Okay, so the JGA, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. I always think of the JG Wentworth those commercials on TV. Every time I see JGA, anywho, juxtaglomerular cells. So these are smooth muscle cells in the afferent arterial. So the vessel that is coming into feed into the glomerulus has pressure sensors. That smooth muscle stretches, we know there's high pressure. Smooth muscle isn't stretched, low pressure. Okay? There's low pressure, we're going to release renin. And then macula densa. Macula densa is in the DCT. So when it sees a lot of sodium, we're going to release renin. Why? So we can hold on to it. So we can increase blood pressure. So here they're showing, there's the afferent, and then there is macula densa. So they overlap each other. What happens is that portion of the DCT runs right next to the afferent and efferent arterial. So remember, smooth muscle in the afferent and 
salt sensors in the macula densa. So we secrete renin whenever there's low pressure or there is high osmolarity, high salt. That means, that means the blood is like low moisture in it, right? That's what we're saying. So we increase blood pressure. That's the goal. The reason being the nephron is really fed by blood pressure. That filtrate that we create and then all the vessels that are passing around it, blood pressure is necessary to feed the cells of the nephron. So if blood pressure drops too much, circulation drops too much, nephrons die. So what does renin do? It, so it says it goes to the liver and that's kind of like, eh. All right. Angiotensinogen, it's a zymogen, it's made in the liver, but it is circulating around. So when we release renin, it acts on angiotensinogen and it converts it into angiotensin 1. So now it's active. Angiotensin 1 continues to circulate and goes to the lungs. In the lungs, there is an enzyme there, angiotensin converting enzyme, and it turns it into angiotensin 2. We need this cascade to happen so that angiotensin 2 can then work in the rest of the body. So what does that do for us? So what does angiotensin 2 do? It causes systemic vasoconstriction. Well, my blood pressure is low. I'm releasing renin. So if I constrict everything around me, I increase blood pressure. It causes us to release ADH. Well, if I release ADH, I insert aquaporins into the ascending loop of Henle, the DCT collecting duct, and I pull water back into my bloodstream. It makes us release aldosterone. Well, if I release aldosterone, I reabsorb sodium. I secrete potassium. By pulling in that sodium into my bloodstream, I hold on to more water. And then it tells us to be thirsty. If I drink water, I put more into my bloodstream. I help dilute everything. So the drug lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitors stop the formation of angiotensin 2. We're stopping this. By doing so, we do not constrict afferent arterial and we increase GFR. So they actually work to reduce this. They reduce blood pressure. It's the first line drug for reducing blood pressure. We give it to diabetics to increase that afferent arterial since it's not being constricted by um, angiotensin 2. So JGA's purpose, increase blood pressure. How does it do it? Releases renin. What does renin do? It converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 goes to the lungs, and we have ACE inhibitor, I'm sorry, ACE, angiotensin convert, uh, converting enzyme, and we turn it into angiotensin 2. Then angiotensin 2 does all of those things for us. So when you give, when you give the like lisinopril, it helps inhibit all of that, and we get quick relief of blood, high blood pressure. All right, micturation and urination. So when we talk about creating urine and actually urinating, it's parasympathetic. I do it when I'm resting and digest, all right? Sacrum is what's uh, getting the signal. And how is it getting the signal? Bladder stretch. So as we stretch the bladder, it sends a signal. And then when it is convenient to us, we send a signal to relax the external urethral sphincter and bladder wall contracts, and we urinate. What's wild is, and we talked about this like with stool, it's the same thing. It's skeletal muscle. Skeletal is voluntary. That means you could like, you train children. Some people will start potty training their child at like your like 
at 10 months or so. Some of them could start, you can start doing that and they can be potty trained and they hold it through the night. That's kind of the wild thing. Like subconsciously, you control this voluntary skeletal muscle through the night from a very young age. All right. So urethra. Females, short urethra. Because of this, that's why we see UTIs in them. Um, males, you typically don't see UTIs. It's pretty rare for a male to have a UTI. Can it happen? Yes. Okay. Um, did I share the story with you guys about the male UTI guy? I don't think I shared it. I shared it with the class recently. I think it was my micro class. So a buddy of mine is a urologist. He's a sick individual, right? So um, there was a 16-year-old male came into the ER, repeat UTIs. And the ER doc like had called my buddy down for a consult. And they're kind of grilling him and they're like, are you doing something? Are you doing this? Like, what, what's going on here that you're getting recurrent UTIs? This is not normal 16-year-old male. Anatomy is correct. Everything's correct. And so they keep on pushing with him. And then finally, the kid fesses up. I don't know. Him and his girlfriend, one of their parents is a nurse. They took a catheter from them. And they were self-cathing each other for fun. And repeat doing it and using the same catheter. So they were introducing bacteria into the urethra, causing the UTIs. It's a quality story. All right. Yeah. I don't know how that's fun. Anyhow, it's, it's a good story to share. Can you see UTIs in a male? Yes. Like I said, it's pretty rare. You're going to see more of it because some of the new medications for diabetes, they cause them to urinate out um, excess glucose. We lower that threshold is what we're doing. We're inhibiting it. We're inhibiting the reabsorption of glucose. So they pee it out. So just naturally they are at higher risk of UTIs. Uh, they're also at a higher risk of like penile necrosis in males um, because of the excess glucose and the bacteria growing on it, causing really bad infections. Not a nice medication. Right. Now, as far as controlling urine, when we get older, we get laxity in sphincters and then pregnancy. Pregnancy is the big one that causes this. Um, so when we see this uh, stress incontinence, stress incontinence is typically you talk about with in women, it's more common post pregnancy. They say they say pretty much every woman, once they have a child, they tend to develop this. Um, because of that stretch. And so anytime they increase abdominal pressure, it stresses the system and they urinate a little bit. Uh, so that's why they say like laughing, sneezing, coughing, any of that can be triggers. They can actually surgically correct it. They can go in there and tighten that urethra, uh, um, sorry, the sphincter up and, and get rid of the issue. So it is, it is correctable. So males, mm, really less bladder infections. Like I said, in the hospital, you'll see it from like catheters, especially if they're placed for too long. That's why we like switch catheters frequently. Um, so you really don't see too many UTIs in males. Now, if you have like an older male and they're wearing, you know, like adult diapers, something like that. Yeah. There's increased risk. Okay. Um, Males, pretty much every male will develop BPH. BPH is benign hypertrophic or uh, some, some books will say hyperplasia uh, of the prostate. Uh, benign prostate hyperplasia, hypertrophy. Okay? It's not cancer. It's just the urethra is passing through the prostate. And what happens is the cells swell. And when they swell, they choke down the urethra. So when the male goes to urinate, they can't empty all the way. They may experience dribbling. And then they may, they're going to experience repeat needs to go to the bathroom. So typically they talk about like it interrupts their sleep at night uh, because they have to get up and urinate multiple times throughout the night. And they say pretty much, not a majority of males will develop it. Uh, as they get older. It's very, very common. 
there are procedures they can do to reduce it. And then there are medications like Flomax, for example, that they give. They even give Cialis for it. There's a couple of different medications they give to reduce the size of the prostate. It does not convert to cancer, all right? Um, so when we look at urine, and this is something you guys are doing in lab this week, we take urine samples. And urine samples are... They're more important, in my opinion, for like women and then like diabetics, stuff like that. Men, it's, it doesn't hold too, too much value. Typically, when you take a urine sample, you're really looking for, is there a UTI? Or is there glucose in there? So when we look at the urine sample, if they're, if they're well hydrated, it should be kind of clearish. Not all the way clear, but kind of clearish. And then the specific gravity will be altered. So specific gravity is on a normal urine sample, 1.005 to 1.035, if memory serves correct. Okay. What is what that's saying is there's solute in there that is altering the density and increasing it of the urine. So like pure, pure water, I think has a density of 0.996. So it, it's way less dense. So when people try and beat like drug tests, if they're outside of specific gravity, like if you're on probation and you chug a bunch of water before you go in to give your urine sample for like a drug test and you're below that 1.005, it's an automatic back to jail. They don't play. Okay. So... Anytime you're increased secretion in the urine of solute, you drive up that specific gravity. So when you talk about like, let's a diabetic, they've exceeded threshold. They're urinating a lot of glucose out. We should see specific gravity increase. Okay. You should see a lot of extra stuff in there. If you're dehydrated because you're not releasing water in there, there's a lot of solute in there. It's going to be much darker. And then what happens? Specific gravity drives up. If you take vitamins, urine is typically very yellow after you take a vitamin. Why? Because you're urinating out the excess, driving up specific gravity. Okay. Um, diabetes insipidus. Specific gravity would be super low because... There's no ADH. They can't reabsorb the water. They're just peeing out water. And then pH. We help control the acidity in our body by peeing out hydrogen ion or holding on to it if we're too basic. Okay. So osmolarity of the urine. ADH is the big player there. If we're holding on to water or not. That's going to concentrate the urine or dilute it. Odor, depending on what you eat, you secrete it. Some people can smell it. Some can't. I mean, like if you eat asparagus and you can smell it, that means you have an active gene that others don't. You can smell it. Okay. Caffeine. Some people can smell caffeine in their urine. The ammonia, the waste uh, from there, that's like, you know, like that kind of like burns your eyes a little bit. Like when you talk about like animal urine, stuff like that, uh, that's what's in there. Uh, and then just random side note to neutralize it, vinegar. Like if your pet ever pees on like your carpet or something, put vinegar on it, it neutralizes it and helps them from going back to it. A little side note. Solute, so any waste that we're getting rid of, all of, all the guys that we've talked about. The problem with this is, especially when we talk about ions, ions naturally want to bond. And so when they bond, ionic, like ionic bonds, you create crystalline structures. So when you start to mix certain things in your diet, you are at higher risk of developing stones, kidney stones. If your urine is always too concentrated, increased risk of developing kidney stones. So hydration is important. Um, and then there's certain foods like things that are high in calcium, things that are high in oxalic acid. So that's all your leafy greens, dark beers can be a trigger, 
Uh, and I think like kidney beans, stuff like that. So sometimes when patients have like those repeat calcium oxalate, oxalate stones, it's like your standard stone, your most common, they have to avoid those foods. They have to stay well hydrated. There are genetic disorders that cause stones. So you guys are going to look at that in lab. Uh, and if you Google, like when you guys do that, there's a microscope you look in, it has a uh, stone that you look at. And if you Google it, you'll find it. Uh, that one's a genetic disorder where they form stones frequently. I had a girl in high school, a classmate. She used to have kidney stones all the time. And I wouldn't be surprised, given her age and everything, uh, that she had one of those situations. Kidney stones are hellacious, uh, especially for males. So depending on the size, they can get stuck. They don't want to come out. They have to be surgically removed. Uh, and then they can fragment them. And when they fragment them, they can be sharp and they literally tear up the urethra as they're coming out and you have to catch them. And the reason you have to catch them. So they give you a little strainer to pee through is they have to identify what's the composition of the stone. So stone kidney stones are horrendous to have. Um, so you typically what the patient will present with is, uh, one-sided flank pain. So on one side, they're just getting pain and they'll feel it radiating towards the groin because it's coming out of the one kidney and it's starting to go down the one ureter. And so that's why it's one-sided. Uh, they'll be bent over, severe pain, sweating, that kind of thing. It'll go away once it makes it to the bladder and then all hell breaks out again once it makes it into the ureter or the urethra. Um, so yeah, kidney stones are not fun. And it's pretty neat how they break them up. They use um, ultrasonic waves. They'll put you in like a tub and you sit in it and then they vibrate it so so much that it uh, starts to break them up. Okay. Um, so abnormal components of urine, we said glucose. We should never ever see glucose unless you're a diabetic. Amino acids, we shouldn't see unless you're like, you're doing a keto diet. Never ever protein, ever. No protein whatsoever, okay? No blood cells whatsoever, unless they have like a UTI, stuff like that. Hematuria, that's where we see urine, or sorry, we see urine. We see blood in the urine. There's gross hematuria. That's where the patient comes in and they say, I see blood in my urine. And then there's microscopic. That's where you do a urine uh, sample and you do the little dipstick in it and it pops positive that there is some blood in there. Uh, those can be identifiers for like stones, infections, cancer. There are so many reasons why we could see uh, red blood cells in the urine. And we should identify why. We always should identify why because it is abnormal. So bacteria, typically what we tell the patient is you need to do a clean catch. A clean catch is a midstream catch. Uh, they start to urinate, stop restart and that's when they catch and the reason being is bacteria starts to climb up the urethra so we try to um get them to flush it out before they start collecting it that being said you know you, you see a little e coli in there meh. if the patient doesn't have complaints meh, we don't treat it because it's probably just contamination um if they have complaints that's a different story right Pyuria, so that is pus in the urine, typically means infection, okay? And then ketones, you're not going to see ketones unless someone is on, they're exercising a lot to break down fat, they're on like keto diet, um, so they're breaking down fat, or they're a diabetic, and that's really the only, or starving, not like, hey, I'm, I'm starving, I haven't had lunch yet, no, starving like, three days plus not eating. I believe it takes about three days before you start going for fat, if I remember correctly. The first three days, your body goes for protein, well, glycogen, then protein, then fat. It takes three days uh, to get to that point. You know, it's interesting. I was watching uh, local news last week and they were talking about, they had a doctor from Emory and she was talking about, she's like, yeah, we're kind of rethinking dieting nowadays. And they used to always say like, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And now they're like, 
do intermittent fasting, don't eat. <laughs> um, they're saying it is the most efficient in lowering cholesterol, lowering um, sugar level, blood glucose levels. And so what they're saying is like, eat your last meal like around 8 p.m. at the latest kind of thing, and then fast till about noon. Um, they want you to eat a bigger meal at lunch and then eat small meal or snack for dinner. And that's it. They're reevaluating how we thought like the body works a little bit. It's kind of interesting. I started doing that like January plus like working out and stuff. And I, I've noticed a big difference, big difference. Um, you get used to it after a week or two. Yeah. You're not hungry. Yeah. I usually go till two 30 after y'all's like, or my next class. So it's not bad. All right. Amount of urine. Uh, it depends on how much, you know, fluid you consume, but somewhere between one to two liters a day. These next two, kidney failure. You never, ever want to see this. So anurea, less than 50 mLs a day. So what they'll do is they hook up a catheter to the patient and they collect it into a bag and we measure it. You see that anurea, their minimum acute kidney failure, if not chronic kidney failure. Oligurea. So that's a small amount, less than 500 mLs a day, also considered kidney failure. Um, you never ever want to see this. The, the problem is, is now they're not getting rid of waste. Waste is increasing in the body. They must have dialysis. Dialysis is not fun. You go three times a week, several hours each time. I think I mentioned they'll lose 10 to 15 pounds every event. Uh, because that's how much like crud is built up in their body they cannot get rid of. So not not good. Our kidneys are working all the time uh, to filter our blood. So, And I think we talked about number one cause of people ending up on dialysis or end-stage renal disease, diabetes. It's just wild. We're doing it to ourselves. Okay. So GFR, we mentioned this, 125 mLs a minute, right, quarter of our cardiac output, how do we increase GFR? We dilate the afferent arterial or constrict the efferent uh, to increase that pressure and send it through the nephron. We looked at this, so calculating um, net filtration rate. So they're saying like hydrostatic uh, of the glomerulus is uh, 60 and then remember, anything else is a push back. So the osmotic pressure from like the solute, the albumin, all of that is pulling back in. And then the capsular pressure is pushing back in. Um, and you just subtract the two from your hydrostatic and remember to tell us which way it's going. So net filtration into the nephron, 10 millimeters of mercury. We talked about this. We just ran through this. All right. So let me see. Yeah. Okay. So controlling it, um, sympathetic. So sympathetic, fight or flight. I don't want to urinate. I don't want to produce urine. If I'm running from a tiger, I don't want to stop to have a pee break. Okay. <laughs> it's not going to make sense. It's not going to work out well for us. Uh, so what do we do? The sympathetic will constrict the afferent, the one coming in. By doing so, we decrease blood hydrostatic pressure. By doing so, we decrease filtration into the nephron. No urine produced or minimal, right? So autoregulation, that is the kidney taking care of itself. So if for some reason... You go into fight or flight and you vasoconstrict vessels. Blood pressure will increase, right? Your heart rate's also going to increase. So cardiac output increases. Blood pressure is going to increase. It's too much. It's too much for the kidney. GFR would skyrocket. So what does it do? It constricts the afferent. By constricting the afferent, we decrease GFR. We decrease hydrostatic pressure. We decrease net filtration into the nephron and vice versa. You take some medication that suddenly like bottoms out your 
blood pressure, slows your heart too much, or um, your vessels all vasodilate. So what happens? We open up the floodgates. We open up that afferent arterial to maintain flow to the kidney so it is not damaged. Tubular, uh, tubular glomerul glomerular feedback. So this is that JGA. This is where when there's too much uh, sodium in there. Um, that doesn't make sense. Hold on. GFR is too fast. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're talking, this is kind of different. So this is like, we're losing too much volume in the end. So when sodium levels are high, we're, we're going to release renin and, and try and, and modulate that. But we're also going to decrease GFR so that we don't lose whatever's coming through, the minimal amount that is coming through. All right. So when you, you guys are going to be doing case studies in lab with a uh, urinary system. So whenever we look at like patients levels for certain things, it's an indicator of is the kidney functioning well or not. So we have BUN, creatinine, potassium, and then we talk about clearance. So when you talk about, for example, hydrogen, we want to maintain that 7.35, 7.45 level of hydrogen in the body. If there's too much, you drink a bunch of lemonade, you're technically going to increase the hydrogen ion level in your bloodstream. So what do you do? You can breathe faster to get rid of it, or you pee it out. So we'll start peeing it out and get rid of it. So if someone has kidney failure, hydrogen level skyrockets, and the breathing tends to speed up. Same thing with potassium. You have too much. You ate a bushel of bananas. <laughs> a bushel. Um, you, you ate a lot of spinach. All right. Your potassium level is increased. You should pee it out. If your levels are increased chronically, that's a sign that your kidneys aren't working right because you can't pee it out. Same thing with blood, urea, nitrogen, blood, blood, right? Urea levels, nitrogen levels. Where do we get this from? The breakdown of protein. If it increases, you're not secreting that waste product, the waste products. We know that your kidneys are not functioning properly. Same thing with creatinine. We get creatinine from... You guys like peaked at it in AMP1. We talked about putting the phosphate group on creatinine to store to store energy for later in the muscle. So when you use that, you break it down um, in the muscle, the creatinine is then released through the kidneys. If it is elevated in the bloodstream, it is also a sign kidneys are not functioning properly. So these are you know, important tests. We, we do them all the time. You know, uh, all your blood work, it always has it on there. Go look at your blood work. You'll see it on there and they'll have appropriate levels and stuff. That is a standard that we check all the time. So clearance is how long does it take to get rid of something in the body? So we're looking at can you clear it appropriately? If you can clear it appropriately, your kidneys are functioning properly. So let's say I give you a drug and within, you know, 24 hours, you pee out 100% of the drug, the clearance is 100%. Quickly, you got rid of it. That's good. Simultaneously, something like glucose, we never ever should pee out. So we should never see glucose in the urine. The clearance is zero. Amino acids, clearance should be zero. Cells, technically, clearance is zero, all right? Um, the clearance rate matters, especially when you talk about medication. So if we go back to like, for example, that caffeine example, you know, a regular person, every four and a half hours, they should clear half of it is what we're saying. 
But if you have kidney failure and you drink some caffeine, it stays in your bloodstream a lot longer. If you give a medication to a patient with kidney failure and they have poor clearance, the medication stays in their body a lot longer. So what do we do? We have to change like how we dose them. If like a regular person, we dose them every four hours, eh, maybe this person is every 12 hours, okay? It's going to maintain in their system. So clearance, high clearance, you're getting rid of it. Low clearance, it's staying in you, all right? Acid base, so we talked about this with respiratory. There's that equation again. At, in, the, in the kidney, we can get rid of hydrogen ion and we can pull back in bicarb. So we reabsorb bicarb in the PCT, we pull it back in. So if a patient has kidney failure, hydrogen level increases and eventually it's offsetting the bicarb, that's a problem. So urine should be acidic. It changes according to diet. And there's like one of the things, for example, they always say like when a, a woman has like a UTI, they consume, was it cranberry juice? They always say, it really doesn't matter what you consume. It's if you're consuming an acid, you're going to pee out more acid and it helps kill the bacteria. That's really what it comes down to. Um, the ammonia in there, that also, that also affects the hydrogen ions. It kind of negates it. And then we need to pee it out. So this is that whole, that chart I showed you guys, the acid base and correcting like metabolic versus respiratory correction, all of that. So go through that, be familiar with that. By the way, an old school like trick for, um, I forgot to mention it, for kidney stones. When a patient has kidney stones, they'll tell them like drink a bunch of water like chug a lot of water and then have a beer because alcohol inhibits ADH. So what happens? All of a sudden, all this volume of fluid will flood out of them and it can help clear the kidney stones. Old school trick. But yeah. It, uh, I guess we can move on to fluid and electrolytes. Why not? Why not? All right, we're here. Come on. Come on. Where is my fluid and electrolytes? Jump on. Where? Oh, no, oh, no. Oh. There we go. So a lot of this we've kind of been covering as we're going along. Um, we talked about intracellular and extracellular when we're looking at vessels. So intracellular is the fluid inside the uh, cells. Uh, extracellular is anything outside of that. So... When you look at like, where is extracellular fluid? The interstitium. So that's between the vessel and the cells, the plasma. That's what's inside your vessels. Um, it's any, any fluid outside of cells, okay? Remember compartments. So I have intracellular inside blood. So like my cells that are inside of there. I have extracellular in my vessels. I have extracellular... Uh, interstitial fluid, and then I have intracellular interstitial cells, okay? So there, there's compartments. The point of all of this is if I add pure water into here, into your, into your vein, I add pure water, it's going to rush into the cells inside your vessels. It's then going to go into the uh, extracellular interstitium, so out out here, outside of the vessel, and then it's also going to go into the intracellular of the interstitium. So all the cells out here will also get the water. So that's why you see like, you know, patients will go into the hospital and you give them fluids and they're like fluid overloaded. They'll feel puffy everywhere. And that's because you put so much fluid into them. It's filling every compartment. It's filling the cells and then they're all puffy. And then what happens? You take them you, uh, off the fluids and they start just peeing like crazy uh, because it is leaving every compartment as the body gets rid of that volume. So when we talk about IV fluids, it's added to the extracellular space. What we add influences that. If I put a hypertonic solution, I'm going to jump back here for a second. I give a patient a hypertonic solution. I give them, you know, a high 
like a, a, a 5% solution of sodium chloride, NaCl 5%. That is huge. What's going to happen? The water from the cells in the vessels is going to leave and enter into this compartment, into the vessel. The water from here in the interstitium is going to leave and enter into the vessel. The water from here is going to leave and enter into the vessel. It's the same logic as if you drink salt water. You drink salt water, it's the same logic. It's going to leave the ne in the nephron with the urine, and we're going to start pulling water from every compartment and dehydrating you very, very rapidly. All right. So water input equals water output. The amount you consume should be roughly what comes out of you. We don't realize how much we lose through sweat, especially in um, summer. So you always push patients, you know, drink water, drink water, drink water. You know, can you drink too much water? Yes, but it's so rare. So, so rare. Um, normal person really isn't going to drink too much water to where there's a problem. Drink water, drink water, drink water. Okay. <clears throat> Especially if you drink, if you drink caffeine, drink water, drink water, drink water. All right. So here they're just showing like difference, like areas where, areas where it comes from and how it's leaving. So, if you don't have water in your plasma, the osmolarity increases in your bloodstream. You become salty. So, who detects it? Hypothalamus, right? Are we right? Yes, we got it. Okay. Hypothalamus detects it. Too much osmolarity. What does he release? ADH. What does ADH do? It inserts aquaporins into a setting loop of Henle, collecting uh, DCT and collecting duct. And we pull water back into our bloodstream. Baroreceptors. So if blood pressure is low, it turns on the hypothalamus, we release ADH. We pull more water in. If the JGA... We see that drop in the afferent. We see that increased sodium through the DCT. Yeah, DCT, the macula densa. We release renin. We activate the system. We produce aldosterone. We tell you to drink water. So, you know, a little food for thought. If you're sitting, like you're sitting there right now and you feel a little thirsty, that system is active. Your hypothalamus is telling you to drink water. You're already dehydrated. So think about that. Like as you go through the rest of your day, how often you feel a little thirsty, you're you're dehydrated. I feel like I'm like promoting water, <laughs> selling water here. All right. Um, and let's be clear: water is water, right? Don't don't buy bottled water. Waste of money. Waste of money. Get a Brita. If you don't have a filter in your fridge, get a Brita. Save your money. We talked about this. Okay, same exact slide we just looked at. So, too much water, not enough sodium, not enough sol uh, solute passing the hypothalamus. We shut off the production of ADH, or we reduce it. If there's no ADH, there's no aquaporins. If there's no aquaporins, what happens to osmolarity of the urine? It decreases. Why does it decrease? We're letting water out. That's diuresis. So when we talk about diuretics, that's what they're doing. They're causing us to lose water from our body through the kidney. That's diuresis. So is too much water dangerous? Yeah especially if it's hypotonic water. So the water we use in like our labs, for example, like micro chemistry, whatever, bio, <coughs> we have a special machine that produces pure, pure water, deionized water. It is distilled and then it's ran through a filter to remove everything. It is pure water. It is a true hypotonic solution. You drink that, it'll kill you. How much? Depends on the person. You stop the urinary system for too long, it'll potentially kill the person if there's too much water buildup in them. So there was a lady recently, it was a couple, a couple years ago, I think it was here in Georgia, if I remember correctly. It was a, a competition to win a car. 
And the deal was, it was like some radio station doing this. The deal was you drink a gallon of water, you put your hand on the car, and the last person to leave to go urinate wins the car. She died. Uh, what happened was when you drink pure water or too much volume of water, you start to fill every compartment. You fill your blood vessels, you fill your RBCs, you fill the uh, interstitium, the extracellular interstitium, and then you start to fill the cells in the interstitium, the intracellular there. Well, the one specific thing that happens is in the brain, the myelin around your neurons, it starts to enter into there. The myelin starts to expand, expand, and expand. It demyelinates and it, you die. The neurons are damaged and you die. Uh, like I said, it's pretty rare to see that situation. Typically people that this happens to either they have like a psychosis, they overconsume. I don't know how she held her urine to that point. That is insane. Cause if you try and hold it, eventually the, um, it'll be overridden. You'll just urinate yourself. And then you see it when people are given the wrong IV fluids. That's another situation you can see it in, um, and alcoholics too. So it, you always hang a banana, a banana bag for like alcoholics. So that has a lot of like the ions that they need, the electrolytes they need as a safety measure, uh, because they're so like depleted that when you start to give them water, it's like a, it's like a hypotonic solution to them. <clears throat> um, but yeah, you, you someone hangs the wrong bag. That's the other situation. The wrong IV fluid. That's the other situation you can see it happen in. Someone makes it wrong. Something wild like that. Right. So yeah, hypotonic hyperhydration. Low. So if you don't have enough water, is that dangerous? Yeah. I after after a bit of time, yeah, that's really dangerous. You can't undergo bodily functions, stuff like that. Cells can die. There can be brain damage. Um, blood pressure can tank. So yeah, water, we must have a certain amount of water in our system. Now, when you talk about like populations, how water affects them, young children and elderly are more affected. They're the more susceptible to alterations in water level. So that's why like when like, young children get diarrhea, we start throwing Pedialyte at them like crazy. We throw more Gatorade, whatever, get fluids into them because they, they're not good at hydrating themselves. And then they're losing so much. And the volume that's in them to begin with is low. Same thing with elderly patients. They tend to be skinnier. Um, they don't have much body mass. So when they start to lose water for some reason, they're more susceptible to uh, bad situations. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop there. We are, we are hoofing it. All right. So Wednesday we'll finish up fluid and electrolytes. There's 20 slides left. It's not much. We'll knock that out and then we'll do review. We might just do review on Wednesday if you guys want. And then I can give you Monday off. Let's aim to do that. That way you guys have Monday off. All right. Uh, and you can prep for your tests. So Wednesday we'll finish fluid and electrolytes and we'll do review because we're gonna have plenty of time. And then Monday, we'll, we won't have class. That'll be our plan. All right. I'll see some of you in lab. And if not, I'll see you on Wednesday. Bye.